Today my mission is going to be to suggest to you that if you are a boxer, you are a psychologist. That is, you are good at predicting human behaviour, what human beings are about to do next. If you think about it, as a boxer, you never punch to where someone's head is. You always punch to where it's about to be in a moment's time. And you can distinguish a beginner quite easily in that. They will be punching uh, at phantoms to a head that's no longer there by the time they've completed their strike. So, as a boxer, you tend to know where that target is and where it's going. How do you do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Some of how you do that is visual because you can observe how someone's body is moving, what twitches they make, what gestures. Some of it though is an interpretation. You understand something about emotion and thoughts and using all of this information, you seem to predict what's gonna happen next. In fact, there's a, there's a lo lovely line in this book by Joyce Carol Oates on boxing, which I thoroughly recommend you read. There are boxers possessed of such remarkable intuition, such uncanny prescience, one would think they were somehow recalling their fights, not fighting them as we watch. Does that resonate with you? Have you been in that situation? I know I have, when either watching a fight or being on the receiving end of it, the person in front of you seems to know, almost um, defying time, what is about to happen. That's psychology by another name for me. And we're going to spend the rest of the video understanding how it is we do that. Beforehand, a quick side note on the topic that usually detains us in these videos. Savat, box Francaise. Now, in Savat, when you kick, there is a rule that states you must kick with your shoe and never with your shin, never with the tibia. That requires uh, an even greater anticipation of what's going to happen in a moment, because a kick is slower than a punch. And in order to kick and land accurately with an extended leg, mind, that's one of the other rules, I need to know whether my partner's about to step in, um, whether if I step in, they're going to retreat. I've got to be much more in charge of the information that pertains to what's happening next. So that kicks also have to have the right trajectory. You cannot just swing your kicks in Savat. They have to be armed and then struck, which slows you down. But it slows you down. And I think, I'm going to speculate here, I think that means the, the Savat rules are asking you to rely on your intelligence more than just your bodily speed and, and force. You're not asked to swing yourself or fling yourself at the opponent. You're asked to calculate what's going to happen. And these two rules, the shin, the no shin rule and the trajectory rule, I believe are slowing us down for that kind of a purpose. Because you have to really spend some while anticipating what's going to happen if you can do those two things. Not to say that speed and bodily force are not useful attributes in Savat, but there is the emphasis of the sport, if you ask me my opinion. To our second book, and this is on my Kindle. Some of you will say, well, that's not a real book. I will counter and say that this is beaten up and old. It's a, 20, it's a 2012 model, at least 10 years. So it's somewhere in between the two technologies. This, in the blink of an eye, is a chapter in a book by David Papenow, who is a philosopher here in London. Uh, the book is called Knowing the Score, and here, in the blink of an eye, he thinks about tennis, and we're going to do that. In tennis, if you're opposite Roger Federer, and he serves, you have 400 milliseconds to respond to that serve. From the time the ball leaves his racket to whizzing past you, 400 milliseconds. And there is a media problem with that. It takes a human being 100 to 150 milliseconds, which is a good proportion of it, simply to do anything. Usain Bolt steps out of the, or uh, bolts out of the, um, the starters block, about 140 milliseconds. And if you think about it, that's a much more simple movement. He knows exactly what he's going to do, and he knows exactly what cue, what trigger is going to cause it. And in boxing, we don't have that. And in tennis, you don't have that. You, you've got to make a complex assessment. That's going to slow you down even more. But if it takes 150 milliseconds just to get out of the blocks, then it takes about 25 milliseconds just to move an arm. Or, or a leg in a controlled manner. That's nearly half the time. Then, and here's the clincher, the visual cortex takes 500 milliseconds, a full half 
second to respond to complex visual stimuli. That's the whole thing gone right there. There's no way, as a human being, when you see the serve, the Roger Federer serve, that you can possibly look at it and know which way it's going because you haven't time to act. And that's not what the tennis player is doing. An elite tennis player opposite Federer is not reacting to the ball coming at him. They're reacting to what's happened prior to that. Maybe there's a way of bouncing the ball that suggests what's going to happen. How deep the shoulder goes. Maybe they know something about his strategy for this match or what he's done the two or three serves prior. All that information allows the elite tennis player to decide which way to go and what to do with that serve. It's borne out in a study referenced in this chapter which puts uh, lenses on elite tennis players and occludes them at the moment the ball is struck and they still go the right way. The information after the strike of the ball is, is un unobtainable. You can't use it. It's what happened before. And I'm going to say something very similar is happening in boxing. Because if we stand about a punch distance away from each other, about the same sort of time scales are involved. I did a little bit of uh, Googling searching to see how quick a punch can move and assessments vary between uh, 5 meters per second, 10 meters per second, sometimes 2. Uh, boxing science says that it's between 70, so 50 and 100 milliseconds to complete a punch. And if you think my arm is about, what, 75 centimeters, if I move that punch at 10 meters per second, it would take 100 milliseconds to, to make the meter, therefore 75 milliseconds to make the punch. You can slow it down a bit with the acceleration that starts off uh, and maybe the trajectory isn't completely straight, but we're talking that kind of order. Yeah, Even if it were 5 meters per second, that 75 becomes 150, you could even make it 200, 250, it's still within that 500 milliseconds you have to respond to complex visual information. So respond to complex visual information, you will not. No, when you stand in front of someone, if you stand in front of me and I jab you, you're not looking at that fist and deciding. Boxers say, don't they, that it's the punch you don't see that knocks you out, but actually they don't see any of them. Yeah, you're kidding yourself if you think you can see this punch. What you see is what happened beforehand. Um, our, our eyes trick us. Our eyes never follow a, a continuous path, either a punch or a tennis ball or anything. They saccade. They move in jerky movements. Uh, you can test this if you have a, a clock with a second hand. Do you ever get the sensation you look at the second hand and it, and it stopped? It's stationary for too long? Well, that's because your eyes saccaded over there quickly and filled in what happened a moment before. So if it arrives just at the moment the second hand is, is stationary, it will presume that that's what happened a moment before. Your, your visual perception fools your consciousness into thinking that it's acting continuously and it is not. It's getting a series of jerky movements. So you won't see the punch coming, but you do understand how an opponent behaves. You understand what kind of jerk precedes a punch. Maybe you've sparred with me before and you know that I'm likely to step in maybe before I strike. You know if you're boxing, uh, fighting in a competition, that it's the end of the round. They're likely to throw more than they are to, to faint. Maybe your opponent is always aggressive. You know that about them. You're being, you see, a psychologist. Um, both a behaviorist, you look at my behaviors and decide what's happening. And you're thinking about, you know, what emotions I'm going through, what I'm thinking myself, and making your decision based on that. Which is, is why I give a one-star review to those devices that put um, a ball on a string around a fighter's head and they pump their arms throwing it. Because, yeah, you're, you're developing your punch in a way. Your, your muscles are literally moving faster and it's unpredictable. But you're not gathering data about how human beings behave. So you're not going to be able to use that come the day or come the sparring when there's an actual human being to respond to. You're not improving your predictive abilities. There's a reason to stand in front of your sparring partner for hours upon hours. There's a reason to lose your fight and come back still having a learn. You now know something more about how the next person's gonna move. You're a better psychologist. An objection to this, or maybe something I can tell you're dying to, um, to cry out in, uh, in response. This does not mean that you should somehow make your responses unconscious. 
it's true that there isn't conscious time enough to respond to this and I'm not going to say best thing to do is to sit with a pen and paper like an experimental psychologist would and decide what's going to happen you haven't got time for that but it would be a mistake to switch off and to let yourself be automatic and that's quite in vogue a sort of no mind approach or um, emptying yourself and just responding to the information that really only gives you one response to every case if our tennis player did that they would probably go the same way every time right because there's only one response to be made to that sort of information a service coming you react as boxers maybe i've got a good slip and counter to your jab but if i want to elaborate on that i want a better repertoire i can't switch off you will know that you can change your unconscious reflexes with conscious thinking because you can go into your sparring match or your competition and say i'm going to let this person overextend their jab and then counter them or i'm going to slip inside and, uh, and work on the inside you can decide in advance what you're going to do and you kind of have a template or a vignette of the response and you've trained it and you apply it in unconscious time your conscious strategy affects your unconscious reactions and that's what you're doing it would be as i say a mistake to switch off in the round because you might need to change your strategy you haven't time to stop and think and, and uh, formulate your response but you can decide hang on the the pull back and let them overextend isn't working i'm going to start countering them where they stand that you can do only if you think about it and let your conscious thought affect what you're doing unconsciously in this very very fast time that was quite a long-winded talk but i hope i've gotten somewhere near my suggestion i made at the beginning which is you if you box you're a psychologist you use information about body movements about fears emotions thoughts anxieties and you use them to understand what a person is about to do so what i want you to do is comment below with whether you think i'm right whether you think you are a better psychologist a better predictor of human nature because you box if you happen to do so that tell me whether you agree with my assessment that because we can't shin and we have to use a good trajectory we are subject to this all and more pitch in those are my thoughts about boxing anticipation psychology and understanding an opponent let me know yours and until next time enjoy your training